I'm Callum. No, you're not. <laughs> I'm Callum. <laughs> I am Spartacus. I am Spartacus. What? I said I'm Spartacus. But you're, you're just you're Callum first. You need to pick what you are. Pick and choose. Pick and choose. Okay, I'll be Callum. Who, who do you want to be? Spartacus. You can't be Spartacus. Why can't I be Spartacus? Because he was a bloke what lived hundreds of years ago in that. There's lots of people that will lived hundreds of years ago and people still have the name. I, I don't know many people called Spartacus. Oh, wow, well, I don't know many people called Callum, but here we are. <laughs> Especially not spelt with one L. Exactly. It's annoying. To be fair, I actually would prefer that with one L though, because I feel like... I hate when people put extra letters in names that don't need to be there. Yes, Mum always used to say it's Callum when it has two L's because it's the word call. Yeah. Or Caleb. Yeah. Anyway, uh, now we've established who we are. I don't um, think you ever said that you're Johnny. Well, I think that, I feel like if they're listening to episode three of season two, they know. Well, they know. Anyway. We are here with another rip, tickling, energetic, fantastic episode of our podcast. Was it really necessary to hit the table when you said that? Yes, it was. <laughs> um, anyway, and we would like to remind you, first of all, to go and like and subscribe to our social medias. And what are our social medias, Callum? Untitled Film Podcast, one word, on Instagram and Facebook, although we do Instagram more, you're more likely to get to us. So go to the Instagram in the first instance. And if you're feeling extra saucy, go and do the Facebook as well. And we do interact with people on there. So, yeah, come on forward and interact with us. And we're and... starting to get a few regular listeners. My friend from work, James, he's, um, he tells me each week, oh, I heard that episode that you did. Interesting. Uh, positive? Yeah, yeah. He, he messaged us as well to tell us that uh, he really didn't like the Lindsay Lohan Christmas movie. Ah, that was him, was it? I yes. didn't see a message and I thought it was your friend, so I left it for you to answer and you didn't answer it. No, I figured I'd speak to him at work. Oh, well, fair enough. Um, I know a few regular listeners, but uh, well, I'm not going to name drop them. Because <laughs> you're too cool for I'm that. Just too cool. Too suave. I would name drop them if they messaged us on social media. So there's your challenge. People like Mr. Dogbrain videos and others. Yeah, start sending us messages. Send it doesn't even have to be polite. I would like it to be polite. I mean, we would prefer it to be, but if, if you told us how rubbish we are, we'd still call you out. So, you know. Yeah, we just really... Ran you know, last week I ranted about Netflix. For about half an hour? Yeah, to the times that by two. That's what I'd rant about. But anyway... But anyway, follow us on our socials. We have said we are going to do more stuff on there this new year and this season two. The beat season two is going to be the year of the socials. And do all the things that you do with podcasts. You like them, you share them, you give them five stars, all that kind of stuff. Tell everyone about us because the only way that we, will, we can continue to afford to do this with all the expenses that go into making a podcast is if you like, share and subscribe to this. So, yeah. You know, we've got a few hundred listeners a week now, and we want to get some more. That would be lovely. Mm. That's a complete lie. We don't have a few hundred listeners, but... but. <laughs> I was thinking of Callum. I thought Callum would call me out for the lie, but no. I, I was being optimistic that you, were, <laughs> that you weren't lying. <laughs> well, no, it's not a few hundred, but it's 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 up there. Anyway, um, Welcome. We will start off as we always tend to start off with the news and Callum. Ow. There's your pen lost. I win. This It doesn't work so well on audio, but I picked up a glass of water at his insistence that his pen was gone and pretended to throw it across. Do you think it's funny explaining the joke? I think jokes are always really funny when they're explained. <laughs> well, should we uh, crack on with the news? Yeah, yeah let's do it. Let's so uh, do it. it's been a, a week for the Guild nominations. It's that time of year again. Last week we were talking about the Golden Globes. And now both the Screen Actors Guild and the Directors Guild of America have announced their nominations. And that's usually a good sign of 
who gets the guilds is kind of about 85 to 90 percent pretty locked up of who's going to be winning so just looking first at best supporting actors and i won't go through all of them of course because that will take up too much time like uh johnny talking about netflix for 45 minutes um so just to just do the best supporting actress um angela bassett for black panther i think she's probably going to get a nomination more so a legacy nomination because she's angela bassett uh you got hong chow for the whale who's also in the menu um so that's something uh, one of the films that we're going to be talking about You've got kerry condon for the banshees of Inisherin, and two nominations for everything everywhere all at once for jamie lee curtis and Stephen. Uh, sorry stephanie hasu um, yeah, so that's fun. And then we've got the Directors Guild of, of America. One of the big ones is that the director for Top Gun Maverick got in. It looks like all indications point to that Top Gun Maverick is not just going to be that film that gets a few technical nominations, as people predicted kind of at the start of the year, because big budget blockbusters, they don't usually get in unless they're exceptional, which it is. It is very good. But, you know, with a Guild nomination like that, the Golden Globes, I think it's going to get Best Director and Best Picture at least, so that, and as well as a bunch of technicals. Well, let's be honest, it's because they listened to my end-of-year review. Oh, yeah. So finally, Top Gun Maverick has got the credit that it deserves. Absolutely. Yeah, it's all because of you. It's all because of you, Johnny. It really is. My first piece of news is that Mr M. Night Shyamalan is back. I'm actually really looking forward to this one. I am. It's interesting, isn't it? Because he's had such an interesting career direct, directory? D- directory. Or trajectory. Trajectory, yeah. It's, it's been a long week. <laughs> it's only Wednesday, but it's been a long week. Um, and <laughs> he kind of obviously had a few big hits, um, kind of got better, better. But I would argue the film's got better and better. Really good people are like, oh, yeah, that's the twist guy. And then some would say the twist started to go too far. The wheels very quickly came off that wagon. And by the time the village happened, he kind of yes. was seen as not great. And then and then he started wasting money on these really big budget movies. The that Happening. No one went to see. I went to see The Happening. And, and our friend, Dog Brain Video, yelled at the screen, as far as I know. He did, yeah. Um, and it, was, it is that bad. Or The Last and Airbender then, and After Earth. And then, but then he kind of had that weird thing where he went back and made a spin-off of one of his early films, but was a low budget, and it was good. Well, this is what he's been doing. Someone must have te- told him, if you keep making these high-budget blockbusters that no one goes to see, you're going to make yourself unemployable. Like, for example, where's Eli Roth? You know, there are some directors who have all the buzz early on, and then make themselves unemployable by making flop, 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 flop. M. Night Shyamalan, someone must have told him, or maybe he had the idea yourself, you've got to make these high-concept, low-budget thrillers that you can make a really good trailer out of. Because since The Visit in 2016, I believe, that's all he's been doing. They're trailers with big hooks in them. Mm. Like, what if there was a beach and it made you old? Made for twenty million dollars, and people went to see it. But was what was the one, the, the first one where they merged them together? Of oh, that was um, Glass, but, uh, I believe. No, Glass was the second. No, Glass is the first. No, Glass is the second no, one. Split is the first one because yes. that's one of the split personality. But it's actually the third one. The, uh, the second, second one. one. And, and the third um, one. because Unbreakable yeah. is first. Glass, and then no, sorry, Split, uh, split then glass. and then Glass. Um, but what year was Split? Uh, 2016 or 17 it was the yeah, that was the first third. one that I noticed he was going back and then obviously he got his little Amazon uh, his little um, Apple TV series yes. as well so The Visit was first and that was the lowest budget and it made something like 10 times its money now he's in the sort of 20 million range I suspect what really happened was he probably still wanted to make 100 million dollar movies and people went no not yeah. giving you 100 million dollars you Pissed it all up the wall before, twice. But it's so. funny, he's now probably one of the only sure things in Hollywood. Yeah. Since 2015, since The Visit, all of his films have been major money spinners. And modestly, but but still, you know, hit after hit after hit. But like you say, he has really kind of embraced knowing how to do a good trailer. Um, and speaking of which, the reason I'm mentioning his new movie, At the Cabin... Knock at the cabin. Knock at the cabin, sorry. Was because they, um, the trailer hooked me. I was like, I like this idea. Yeah. Kind of reminded me a little bit of that, the um, David Kelly movie that was a big flop, The Box. 
box. Is it the box oh, or the button? The box. Oh, yes. I do where, remember um, that. Anthony, Richard Kelly. Richard Kelly, sorry. Where um, Anthony Lingella, Frank Lingella, I'm getting all the names wrong today. <laughs> yeah, Frank. Frank, it is Frank. Is it Frank? Is it Lingella? Ling- yeah, it is. Anyway, him. Uh, he turned up at a door with a box and you had to press, if you press the button, you got a million pounds or something. And if you press, but the person, person died. the person died, you didn't know who was going to die, but someone would die. It's kind of similar. It feels similar. Like the whole world dies if you don't kill one of you. And it's based on a book. One of your family. And um, the ending to the book is much contested. Like people think it's a really great two thirds of a book. And then what? That ending? Really? But I haven't read it, so I can't say. Interesting. It'll be interesting to see because that kind of M. Night has That's had his that in his career. Right? Yeah, exactly. Even in this new era, his films haven't necessarily got better. What if there was a beach, but it made you old? It's just the dumbest movie. But he knows how to... He's, a, he's, he's turned into a market man rather than a filmmaker. Mm. But he's a good market man. That film, Old, was like one of the only films during the pandemic to make any money. Yeah, yeah. There was a few... I think there was a couple of Bloomhouse horrors as well, maybe, that did, yeah. but, like, The Invisible Man and stuff. There was a, about four or five big, or modest money spinners yeah. that were kind of genre films, and his was one of them. Absolutely. No, it was an interesting situation. Your next piece My of news. My next bit of news, actually speaking of Blumhouse, um, Atomic Monster and Blumhouse are going for Night Swim with Wyatt Russell and Kerry Condon. And we mentioned Kerry Condon because uh, she's probably going to get an Oscar nomination for the Banshees of Inner Sharon. So her stock has risen quite a lot. Uh, You know, no longer is she just doing the odd episode of Better Call Saul here and there as as the daughter to, I forget the name of the bald fella in, in that. Oh, uh, Mike. Mike, yes, Mike. Um, Mike Ehrman Trout. Yes, and it's going to be uh, directed by Bruce Maguire, and it's going to be uh, produced by James Wan, who, of course, we know from the Saw movies. So I think we know what to expect with this company and with James Wan. It's going to be lots of banging doors and shrieking at windows yeah. and things like that. This could be solid three to four star. Yeah, solid three movie. to four star, and it's good cast. I really like Wyatt Russell. I, I really like Kerry Condon. Probably made for about twelve million dollars. Probably make. About 50, 50 60, 60 to do well on VOD as well. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. One of the, another one of the only sure things in Hollywood is James Wan producing a movie. Yeah, very true. And anything kind of Bloomhouse A24, they all seem to do well. Yeah. And they, they are part of the same group. We got they? through the news in less than uh, 14 I haven't got minutes. my second piece of news. Oh, sorry. Is, is it going to be another one. rant at Netflix? No, it's actually just going to say that The Last of Us video game has been made into a TV series. Traditionally, video games cannot be made into movies or TV series without being absolute fucking stinkers. I've seen multiple five-star reviews. I think it's got like 84% on Metacritic, and they've given all nine episodes to the reviewers. It's not like just a good first episode or something. It sounds like they've made a good video game thing. Oh, Hallelujah. Hallelujah. The gates have opened. I know in the UK it's going to be on uh, Sky Atlantic slash Now TV. I don't know, in the US. I think it's HBO. I thought it might be HBO, because that's where the stuff from Sky Atlantic often comes from. But yeah, so watch the last of it. It's just a, just a short PSA. Watch the last of us, apparently. Yeah, it sounds apparently like it's, it's going to be good stuff. And we like Pedro Pascal here mm. in this house. Absolutely. Excellent. Well, well on to the main on part the of main the podcast. main course, I guess. Um, it's gonna be, I, I would it's... just like to say... the. My rant can't have been that long because we're about the same amount of time into the podcast <laughs> as we were. Maybe just this felt really week. long. Well, you know, uh, I've let you have enough rants or well, that's true. Long, long, long winding, winding, kind of going nowhere tangents. Exactly. So I feel here like we I'm allowed one. Yeah, I think I think you've earned it. Um, okay, what was that? That was the dinner bell. I suspect there's going to be a lot of uh, food puns in this episode. <laughs> on to the main course. On to the main course, indeed. And um, the first film we're going to talk about this week is... The Menu. Uh, starring... Ray Fiennes, Anya Taylor-Joy, Nicholas Holt, and a bunch of other character actor types. Uh, uh, John Leguizamo is also in there. He is. And, yeah. Do we know who's he directed by? Oh, I... Probably have the IMDb page up, but uh, I should have got it up quicker because I knew... You're the names guy. I'm the names. I can't even remember Franklin Jella's name. Uh, Mark Mylod. What's he done before? 
let's just have a quick browse. Uh, he's done a bunch of episodes of Succession, Game of Thrones, Ooh. Shameless, The Affair. It seems to be more TV. I think this might be his uh, his debut, or if it's not his debut, then this is his most high profile film. It's very well shot, um, and it is on Disney Plus. And what is our old movie this week? It is Brazil, the Terry Gilliam classic. And I don't want to give away my opinion too quickly, so I won't. But I did just use the word classic. But that could be loaded. Yeah, great movie. Brazil. Not to give my review away too much. Um, yeah, they are our two movies this week. So, Callum, do you want to tell us about... The menu. Okay, so it kicks off with uh, Anya Taylor Joy and Nicholas Holt. They're waiting for a boat to take them to a very exclusive, highfalutin um, restaurant that's secluded on a little island all of its own. There's a bunch of really kind of food snobby types, like the kind of people that don't really like food. They just like that it comes in little portions and costs a lot of money and lots of. A lot of uh, new money, a lot of old money there. And you've got Nicholas Holt, who is just obsessed with this chef that they're going to see. This, you know, he's very elusive. They, he, he only makes little portions for exclusive little parties like this. But Anya Taylor-Joy, she's not quite so won over. She thinks this whole thing is weird and, and a bit snobby. And as they get to the island, when, and they're greeted by Hong Chao's character, who is the kind of the mater d things start to feel just a little bit off they don't she wasn't supposed to be there and things start tripping over into a more mysterious and quite a nasty little thriller he wasn't supposed to be there annie taylor joy yes annie taylor joy was not meant to be there yeah and yes uh so it is kind of a thriller but it doesn't um kind of lay all of its cards out directly. So before I say my opinion, Johnny, would you like to kick us off with your review of The Menu? Yeah, it was all right. Um. <laughs> it's, a, it's a common theme, that. <laughs> it's my running joke. It's a running gag. Um, yeah, it was weird. Um, I don't really know how to describe or review it. I can't say I didn't enjoy it. <coughs> Sorry about that. Um, yeah, I can't say that. I, I I think I enjoyed it. I think it kind of worked. Um, but I don't think it knew what it wanted to be. I think it had some weird... Weird kind of cutaway gags. So, uh, for all of you, I'm sure a lot of people who've watched this have watched, that listened to this podcast, have watched maybe Chef's Table and that kind of thing, and they have the bit where... They'll cut away to them putting the dish on the table and it'll tell you some facts about it on the screen and it's while the chef's describing it. And they kept doing that when they were talking about the food, which then became a bit of a gag towards the end of it. Um, it felt... It just... It's it just quite weird. It didn't... It, obviously, it starts off... It starts a, you start to think it's a bit of a food movie and then you start to think it's a bit of a movie about... Um, a, a bit of a movie about kind of almost like a you know about a people character story almost like with all these kind of slightly dickish people in a room together, and then you kind of start to weird realize there's something sinister about it. I mean, it shows you sinister in the trailer. I had an idea it was going to be sinister, and then it kind of meanders off and does some things, and then it ends. I don't want to give the ending away, so I can't say too much. But it it. It's just a bit weird, but I, I can't say I didn't enjoy it. I found it to be probably one of the most frustrating films I've watched in recent times. Because I didn't know it was going to be a horror movie or, or a sort of thriller that leads into something a bit more sinister. I'm not even sure if horror is exactly the right word. Because I just saw the poster and it has the chef standing over Annie Taylor-Joy and Nicholas Holt. And it looked like more of a social satire, which it is in part. I just found it to be incredibly timid for what it's trying to do, what it's trying to say. So we're at a period in in our lives where there's an influx of eat the rich genre films. It was kicked off in earnest kind of properly 
by the masterpiece, the granddaddy of them all, which would have been Parasite. And I'm not going to par- compare it to that, because that would be incredibly unfair to compare any film to Parasite. But there was a whole kind of swathe of these, like uh, Knives Out and Ready or Not. Uh, this is the latest one, where it's a genre film, a horror film, that is trying to take aim at some parts of the lifestyle of the rich and famous and kind of show you just how sinister, how nasty it is. It's very us and them social satire, isn't it? Absolutely. Um, And I just found it incredibly toothless, which, again, like you, it's not that I didn't like it. It's just that every time I chuckled, I wanted to laugh. Any time there was a, a slightly scary bit, I didn't jump where I wanted to jump. And when they kind of did allow some ooey-gooey bloodletting, it was a dribble when I wanted it to be bathed in the stuff. And I think the most underrated one of these films, these Eat the Rich horror films, is uh, Ready or Not. And I was wondering, what what is it about this film? It's not quite winning me over. I, it, I, I get it. Everything's working technically well. I can't fault it on it or anything. But why isn't it working? And then... When the film ended, of course, uh, Disney Plus immediately recommends the next film to watch. And the next film to watch, it said, was, you should watch Ready or Not. I said, that's what I wanted it to be. Ready or Not was nasty, where this was mm, slightly gross. It was funny, where this made you titter. It was scary, where this had a, f- a few little jumps. And I can't, and again, I can't fault it. It's, it's not that it's doing anything wrong. It just seems to want to ha- have its cake and eat it for another food pun, in that, <laughs> hey, um, in that everything it does, it does it okay, but I just wanted it to be more, kind of, I kept urging them, come on, you know, do something, push over the edge. And the only person I think who really did is Ray Fiennes, who is fantastic as yeah. this nasty sociopathic chef who just gets more evil and nastier and nastier. It's like, he is what the tone of the rest of the film should be. He has some, some great one-liners and stuff as well, some bits that, yeah, really, like, made me laugh. Um, and, yeah, he, he is the actor you expect him to be, but everyone else in it... I don't know, I quite like Nicholas Hall. I thought I, everyone was fine, good, possible. fine goods, you know. But I think there was... I think it was a, 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 an issue of too many cooks. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I think there was too many characters. So no one really... You never really fleshed out any of their thing. But it didn't also really centre around... Ray Fine's character, or but, even Anya Taylor Joy, really. Yeah, they obviously meant to be the two protagonists, but it had to take cut so much of their screen time away to give it to the other like ten character actors in there that their characters weren't fully fleshed out. But then no one else's was as well. So, like you say, it kind of left a bit lacking from a point of view of of like they. Did, but then, how do you do it? You know, you can't have a restaurant with only four people in. But it's mate, a, it's it a is quite thing. hard. It's a very frustrating thing. It was clearly something where they came up with the idea, which is, I suppose, is everything. But they came up with the idea before they came up with the script, and then the script maybe doesn't quite hang on the bone as well <laughs> as you'd want it to. Maybe it wasn't fully baked all the way through. It felt reheated. <laughs> yeah, it felt like uh, too many ingredients, not enough flavour. Yes. Yeah, everything about it, just, I, Tim, it was timid. Yeah. That's the word, is that I really, when I watch a horror film, I'm kind of a bit tired but of... is it a horror film? Well, okay, let's use a genre film to be more exact, because it has touches of horror, touches of thriller. I just need, when a film commits to several genres, even if it does several at once... I need it to do them in earnest fully. I don't want it to be excuse itself by saying, well, we can't be too scary because we're also a comedy, but we can't be too funny because we're also a, a horror. And we can't be too either because we're also a thriller. It's like, well, do something. Well, Push. It almost felt like... Th- it almost felt like... We're going to have one genre for a third of the movie, then we'll have another genre for a third of the movie, then another genre for a third of the movie... And it was like you were having a um, a French starter and then having Indian for main and then having a um, 
German dessert and it just didn't quite work as a full meal together. And, and I feel that's the problem with most horror comedies and most genre comedies. Oh, he's trying so hard not to slap his leg and chuckle. Um, they never really, they never fully commit to either and so they end up being nothing. And with the only one recently that I've seen, and again... I the wrong call. ingredients mixed together. <laughs> <laughs> oh. Oh, no. <laughs> um, the, the only horror comedy or Misread genre com- <laughs> comedy that I've seen recently to really commit to all things that it's doing has been Ready or Not. And maybe it's a bit unfair to start comparing every film to the only one to do it really properly. But now that I have seen it, and it's not some highfalutin masterpiece, it's not going to win a, or it didn't win awards, it was kind of forgotten about Ready or Not. I just can't really excuse these films anymore for not only going halfway for only for tiptoeing to the line and doing okay and then never committing like well that film did it perfectly well be that film wash me with blood make me laugh out loud no make me chuckle and go oh that was a bit scary wasn't it yeah absolutely so frustrating this film (laughs) yeah i I agree i just don't think it quite worked i think it was a bit half-baked and um it's like a microwave leftover exactly microwaves leftovers left on the kitchen <laughs> well i don't know what i'm doing now anyway no. i think uh i think that probably brings the our review to an end to a close to a close um and on to should we say the main course but first an advert I hope you enjoyed that delicious advert. Um, We are now on to our main film, which this week is... Brazil. No, I've told you about that. I let you stop me. I made the mistake of letting you do it last week, and um, now you're going to do it more, aren't you? I'm never going to stop. Problematic. Anyway, um, so Brazil, open on Jonathan Price. Or was his name is Sam something or other? Lowry, I believe. Yeah, something like that. Um, and he is late for work, scurrying into his Kafkaesque, boring office job in this Kafkaesque world um, where nothing has any meaning and everything has some paperwork. Um, it, it And he wakes from a dream every night where he sees this beautiful woman that he's in love with. He just chases her um, through, the, through the air. He's got wings. <laughs> this, is, this is not going very well. Um, and anyway, he then gets embroiled by his manager into a problem. Somebody had been given a cheque by mis- or been overcharged by mistake. Um, because they got mixed up their names, Buttle and Tuttle. Um, and Jonathan Price has to try and fix this. And in the process of trying to fix this, he realises that the person of his dreams is in the real world. And then the film goes on from there. From that description, it sounds like the most romantic movie <laughs> you could ever... You know, I, I want to see I this romantic it, comedy. I did call it Kafkaesque. Yeah, a, a weird romantic comedy, sure, but... You know, <laughs> I'm intrigued about this romantic comedy, but no, um, Brazil is... It's hard, quite hard to explain. It is hard to explain because it's, it's very much a film of doing several things. Of course, it's directed by Terry Gilliam. It's probably... Oh, no, it is his best film. It is his best uh, film, 100%. By quite some margin. And it's part satire, part comedy, part uh, very dark social satire on, you know what was going on in the 1980s, very grim world, futuristic world that they live in, in this sort of science fiction-esque world. Futuristic, but in a Terry Gillian kind of nothing quite works properly. Everything's kind of like... Everything's a bit shonky. Everything's a bit shonky and everything kind of like is mechanical and twisty. Digital doesn't really exist and TVs don't even have cases around them. So you have a big piece of glass that... that, um, And then the back bit of the TV projects at it. But it's almost like something out of the Soviet Union, the way it looks. Everything's grey and brutalist and, 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 you know, just ugly. Well, I think, it, it, I think it's meant to, you know, it, it channel as a movie, it channels a lot of 
kind of Kafka and, and Soviet, you know, Dostoevsky kind of vibe. Also 1984. Exactly, I was going like to say that. Orwell and that kind of thing as well. And I think they were seen as the, you know, ultimate kind of... Although, there, you know, there is commentary on consumerism and other things in there, but I think it was, um, you know, it was and still is, you know, that kind of ultra... Um, structured, hierarchical, paper, you know, paperwork driven, you're going on the list kind of society. And I think it's, you know, it, it channels a lot of that. And it's a very angry film, but it, the clever thing about it is that it guides us through this post-apocalyptic, no, not, not post-apocalyptic, but uh, certainly a, a desolate future world through one point of view character. So it always keeps us at a fixed focal point where I think a lot of these movies that do talk about the future, they tend to go off too high, too big, and then you end up kind of learning nothing. And through one character who is this, you know, drone in this very boring job, he, he's learning to break out of his very mundane, very uninteresting life. Like he keeps saying, I don't want to be promoted. I just want to get by and have nothing happen to me. And the more he dreams, the bigger his aspirations get to chase this girl yeah, and to break he, out of the society. And he kind of realises maybe there's more to life than paperwork and work and being in a boring flat and maybe that the systems that are built around him are bullshit. Yes, and then they're not for his best interest and in that this world that's been built for people like him is keeping them very much stagnant, staggered in, in a box sort of thing. It's basically like my life. <laughs> I think a lot of people are listening to this going, yep, that's about right. <laughs> it, was, it was quite depressing. I was watching it in the first like, half an hour, which is more about the, moder- the, the mundanity. The monotony. And the... Uh, not just the monotony, but also the kind of like hitting your head against a brick wall, trying to get something s- simple done through layers of bureaucracy. Um, just make me think of life. And I think that's work, but why not just work. it's the, probably the high point of this sort of science fiction, grim future. When people talk about it, it's often touted, and I think by us too, as a masterpiece. And mm-hmm. we've had two of these in a row, because uh, last week I spoke about Dawn of the Dead, which is... I didn't call that a masterpiece. He didn't uh, call that a masterpiece, but it was a similarly desolate future world that is often touted as a masterpiece and I agree with that and then again we have another one we've got to talk about two of my favourite movies twice uh, in a row so that's really also cool also not on Netflix no not, not on Netflix on Disney Plus mm-hmm. uh, but you know we'll, we'll keep that for another discussion but it is perfect in just how narrow its focus is because through how narrow its focus is through the Sam Lowry character we get to see snippets of the world around it him and we notice just how kind of boxy and how how kind of being crunched in he is. So the narrower the focus is, the more that we sort of see in the periphery. And I think that's the best stroke of genius to it. It also has very fun supporting performances. You have Robert De Niro playing... Is he Bustle or Tuttle? I always mix this up. He's Tuttle. He's Tuttle. Hey, he's um, Harry Tuttle. Harry Tuttle, the to rogue... To his friends. Yeah, to his friends. The rogue engine, uh, heating ducts engineer, uh, who's like this kind of Robin Hood, James Bond, <laughs> uh, you know. Uh, I intercepted your call <laughs> uh, to the, the department. The, the, the central, what was it? The central, the central heating department. No, it was um, central heating. It was central, uh, central control. Central control to central control. They'll, they'll take months to come. I've come. I'll fix it. I'll just do this. Here's your problem, and, and that's very fun. But I think the best supporting performance, maybe even the best performance in the film, is Michael Palin. Yeah. Playing the friendly face of fascism, because this film uh, harks back to things like Thatcher, uh, you know, especially when it was made, Reaganomics, things like that. And he's kind of like the smiling face that tells you it's okay before he goes off to torture someone. He's mm. a, he tortures people and kills people for the state, for the government. And when it goes wrong, it's never his fault. It's never his fault. It's not my fault that somebody mixed up Buttle and Tussle. I didn't know that were, this is, the Buttle had a heart condition. It wasn't on Tussle's file. And it's such a good choice. It's that there's an irony in casting Michael Palin, the nice Monty Python member, the the smiley nice one, the the one that your mum liked, playing the most evil man. There's an early scene with him where he's rubbing his temples with this kind of device, like a head massager thing, because he's, you know, he's been torturing people all day. 
and Sam Lowry lets himself into his office and he turns around and he's, he gets all the anger and hatred that this man actually has is bared out just for a second. And then it's back to smiling. Oh, hello. Hello, Sam. How are you? And it's a really scary While performance. While his daughter's playing on the floor well, next to him. His daughter's playing. The, he's got the apron covered in blood. Human blood. And it's a it's really well-judged performance in a film that's, you know, every part of it is really well-judged. It, it's... Terry Gilliam is mixed results, I think we can both agree. Mm -hmm. And uh, he's often overindulgent in his kind of, in his things. But what is so perfect about this film is that narrow focus, that that inward looking thing. It just keeps everything from flying off into the distance, which can be Terry Gilliam's problem. Yeah, and I think it is close to perfect. It's, I'm going to say it, it couldn't be shorter. I can't really see much fat on it to cut out. It really tells the story very well. Um, it gets across its point of view very well, but in a very subtle way, actually. For, uh, for a film that in, in a lot of ways is not subtle in any way, shape or form, <laughs> the kind of point of, you know, um, is, is, is anti... Because is, I was going to say, is anti-authoritarianism. So it's anti the worst pieces of communism. It's anti the worst pieces of capitalism. Um and it, it it does you know it is it's very that it's very kind of yeah and it is it's Kafkaesque it's a little bit um, I feel a bit of uh, um, Camus in there coming through Jonathan Price's character after a while it kind of it's a film that thinks about big philosophical ideas but does it in a really entertaining way which I feel like you can't often say it happens like normally when you get something like that you end up with the fucking tree of life or some bullshit. Um, instead of actually, uh, but this is just entertaining on every level. It's it's funny. Like I laughed quite it's a lot. Very funny, and you can see that Monty Python in yeah. there. It it it's engaging. The set design, and we haven't we haven't talked about how it looks yet at all. Really, it is amazingly shot. Um, it's so cleverly done. Obviously, on probably not a huge budget. Like it was a reasonable budget, but not like ridiculous. It uses clever use of uh, miniatures. Really clever use of miniatures. It feels a bit like Metropolis at mm-hmm. times from that point of view. Um, and, yeah, it's incredibly well acted from ev- from every point of view. Um, and it's it's quite, you know, at times it's hard-hitting. You care about the characters for, for you know, dark... Com- I would call, probably say it's a dark comedy. I think that those are certainly genres in there. <laughs> <laughs> um, and, yeah, I think it really... But it cares about the main characters and you kind of care about them a bit. And, um, yeah, it's just well-judged on every level. I can't really... I don't know... Not a fault. Very few films that I can, can't pick a fault in, but I can't really pick many faults in this. No, it's just wonderful. It, it's, it's Terry Gilliam firing up on all c- cylinders... It's quite interesting. It's our second Terry Gilliam film we have reviewed in this podcast. Did we? Uh, I don't think we ever got around to reviewing Twelve Monkeys. Did we not? No, because we were going to do that for our first episode and pair it with the Brad Pitt film um, Bullet Train, but we couldn't quite get things oh, no. together, and we never did. So we still have that left in the tank if we ever want to do 12 monkeys interesting i forgot we didn't actually talk about it. <laughs> <laughs> i remember watching it for this podcast yeah yeah uh, that's the point actually because bullet train is now out now so that could be could a be. future episode um but yeah no it, it, and it's quite interesting visually i think this probably film is the closest film of his to 12 monkeys kind of the, the, the way the characters are designed they could and be everything. related they could be watched as a double bill i think yeah absolutely um, and I like them both, but Twelve Monkeys is a bit too long and is a bit more messy. Whereas this is straight as an arrow; it's just like perfect. Yeah. <laughs> it's, it there's, really not, there's not really a wasted frame, and even from the little de- like you say, there's these little details of just like there's some nuns and they've got these like up flicked bits on the side <laughs> yeah. of their heads, like to futurize them, or the fact that his mum who is constantly having plastic surgery to get younger and younger and younger until she looks like she's about 25 and is surrounded by men like Madonna in Material Girl. Yes. Um, but when the first time you see her, her hat is a shoe. Um, 
And that's seen as probably the broadest the stuff with the mum. That's kind of where more, most of the broad comedy lies. Mm. So it, it's almost like a respite from from the rest of the film. But it's still a but still a kind of comment on consumerism. Yes, oh, absolutely. Her friend who uh, has the acid face mask and um, she gets sicker and sicker, sicker, and it has more bandages every time you see her. Yeah. Oh, just a slight complication so a slight to the complication. complication. To it the... seems my complication had a little complication. <laughs> But I'll be good as new in no time. <laughs> uh, yeah, it is. Um, and this uh, the other thing is, there's some great kind of like early performances of people like Jimmy Broadbent. Yes, little cameo from Bob Hoskins. Yeah, it is. It's it's quite it, from that point of view, it's quite fun of like spot the spot the kind of interesting characters as well. <laughs> no, it is. It's a great film and a, a heady, hardy watch from me. Absolutely, two thumbs up, way up. Absolutely. So, first off, Callum, what did you think of me- the menu? Yes. Um, what are you going to give it? I wanted it to be so much better. And the frustrating thing is, is that it had stuff in there to display talent and smarts and, and uh, humour and you know, knowledge of, of the genre, but it just didn't commit. It didn't. It was so scared to be any one thing that it tried to be a little bit of all things. And it was really disappointing because of that i think i think i might have to give it i'm gonna to have to punish it a bit because my head says five out of ten but my heart says four wow because i, I want to kind of let this be an example you know you listen out there <laughs> horror filmmakers <laughs> listen to this i'm gonna knock a point off if you do something fairly well but don't commit to it because you're scared of being seen as oh we're not a horror film we're a social satire you know just commit so four out of ten for, to punish you for being so naughty. Wow. Brutal. I liked it more than you did. Um, I liked what it tried to do. I think I liked how it was shot. I found it funny. I thought it probably would pass a five last laugh test. Five so, chuckle test. A five, for, a five chuckle and stroke the chin test. <laughs> 98% of which is from Ralph, um, who was by far the best thing in it. Yeah, he's great. Um, I liked... Just the general act, acting um, across the board, I thought was reasonable, and I was entertained. I did. Funnily enough, for me, I still got to the end and didn't think they needed to cut anything out. I think they needed to lengthwise. It was fine. Yeah, I think they needed to buck up some ideas, but I didn't think they needed to cut anything out. Um, so I'm actually going to give it a six, but it's probably a scrape six. A scrape between five and six. Watch Ready or Not instead. It's on Disney Plus. It will recommend it to you anyway if you watch the menu. So just watch that. It's Why a lot not watch better. them both? Or watch Ready or Not and have a good time. Wow. And I know you don't really like this film, but Brazil. Well, I mean, I'm going to have to give it a zero. No, of course not. It's a 10 out of 10. It's the second masterpiece in, that we've reviewed in a row. And it's wonderful. <laughs> it's giving me the wavering hand. Um, it's wonderful in every aspect. It's... The, his cl- cleverest film it's very funny it's the it is one of the blueprints that people use when they talk about dystopian science fiction and it's earned its place at that table very much so along with things like a uh, higher budget things like blade runner and things like that it's totally deserving of its reputation it's totally deserving of being terry gilliam's best film 10 out of 10 perfect i completely agree i would also going to give it a 10 out of 10 um just to spoil what I'm about to say now, but I think it was pretty obvious. I don't really think... I think even when I've given films 10 out of 10 in the past, I think I've probably come up with faults for them, but I cannot fault this movie. I can fault Blade Runner. Um, I can fault quite a lot of other films, but I cannot fault... You know, I can't fault this. I think it is... I think it's one of the best sci-fi films of all time. I think it's kind of surreal in a way that so many films try to be and don't get right. I think it's really well shot and made can't really fault any of the acting um and i think it as i said kind of earlier i, I just enjoy the the kind of the kafkaesqueness of it and it, you definitely can feel the influence of kafka oozing through you. I mean, he might as well start turning into a bug um and also kind of the pointlessness of not life kind of um uh, kind of Albert Camus kind of vibe and I just love that kind of stuff as well um, Jonathan Price is great it's hands down Jonathan Price's best role as well and he's had some pretty good roles over the years too uh, yeah it's just 
it's just a masterpiece. Um, I think it's actually shocking that it's not more... It's only the second time I've seen it, but it's quite hot. It's always been a film. It's never on TV much. It's never been on streamers until Disney, I don't think. I've never seen it on any I streaming ha- I haven't service. Seen it on anything. It's never it's not a film that kind of comes out on D V D or anything that much. It's not kind of special I think there probably has been recently, maybe some, but it wasn't a film that and it's just a film that doesn't really get the respect it deserves. It's not Terry Gilliam's most p- famous film. It could also film, be probably. a good choice for an alternative Christmas movie. Yeah, it is a Christmas movie. That is true. And that is kind of, again, one of the perfect running jokes all the way through the movie, Mm -hmm. um, is how people kind of use that as a a way to almost break tension or change conversations. I know how you're feeling. So here's some barley water. Yeah, here's a Christmas gift. Um, Yeah, no, I I, I just can't wax lyrical about it enough. It's probably my favourite film you've watched for this podcast. I've seen it before. Yeah, it it could be mine as well. Um, it's certainly up there. So, yeah. Um, you like even more than you like Speed Racer? Well, I think I gave Speed Racer a nine. So, mm. so And it's not... I've given three 10 out of 10s. Oh, no, four, because I also gave um, Sherpa a 10, I believe. Wow. Which other... I know, obviously... Dawn of the Dawn, Dead and Paddington yeah. too. Oh, you did give yeah, Paddington fair. I think it's only my second. Might be. Yeah, might be. Because I am more sparing... <laughs> And on that... Watch Ready or Not. And also watch Brazil, if you haven't seen Brazil, on Disney Plus now. Go. Go, Go right now. If you haven't right listened now. to it, turn this podcast off. If you're on the bus to work, turn that bus around. Get home, watch Brazil. Much better. You've got my permission. Tell my boss that your podcast told you to not go to work and go and watch Brazil. If you're at work, put your your tools down, whatever you're doing. And, and when get you out. get fired and you have to explain to your wife, boyfriend, husband, whatever it is, and she le- she or he leaves you, then tell them that the podcast made you do it. Exactly. Um, and, and it's what Brazil would want you to do. Because the whole, Brazil the whole of Brazil is about not being beholden to your shitty, horrible job. It's about not following the rules. So follow our rules and, and watch Brazil. Exactly. And on that bombshell, uh, bye-bye. See you later.